Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 32. Today we'll talk about the, the key performance indicators for coronavirus, some promising treatments, and some thoughts on LPS graduation coming up. So it's kind of sobering. Uh, unfortunately, things are not headed in the right direction in the United States. Uh, you know, uh, initially, a lot of countries screwed up the first thing. They waited too long to do anything. So Italy, Spain, us made this mistake. Uh, but only a couple countries made the second mistake, which we've made. So most countries got it right after the first mistake and didn't get it wrong the second time, which we have. Uh, there's a few others like Brazil who never even tried. Uh, and the problem is the number of Americans. So if you look at us on a population level compared to, to Germany, if we were like Germany, we'd have only had about 35,000 de dead Americans. We're already at 142,000 already. Our first mistake meant that 100,000 Americans died that didn't have to die. Uh, and, if, and if we had got it right, though, we could have prevented the next wave. And so we're probably going to get another 100,000 Americans dying because we didn't get it right the second time either. Uh, and it's going to keep getting worse until we change our strategy because our strategy so far has been fundamentally flawed. Uh, if we make the key, continue to make these mistakes, mistake number three, meaning still not changing, I'll be surprised if we don't have at least a half a million dead Americans by the end of the year, more than Germany had. And all of this is preventable if we would do the right thing and listen to public health experts. So what is that plan and what is the right thing? Um, well, I, I kind of like the Winston Churchill quote, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Please, are we done trying everything else? The expertise is out there. We've seen, there's so many proven examples and we've known about this for decades, uh, people in the public health sphere. So hopefully our leaders will get past the wishful thinking stage and, and wake up and smell the coffee. Uh, it's interesting to see that CEOs across the country are figuring this out. So this came out, uh, an op-ed written by 21 national company CEOs, people like Best Buy and JCPenney and Foot Locker. Uh, this is just a partial list here on the side, all asking governors, it's time to require masks and scores. Everybody from Walmart to CVS to Sam's, everybody's requiring masks because that is, there is no way to solve this without you know, almost universal mask wearing. Uh, and even yesterday, uh, President Trump came out and said, please with Americans to wear masks. I, I don't know why the change. My assumption is that somebody finally showed him the numbers and literally we're talking a half a million dead Americans if we don't change our course and change it soon. So what is the effective plan? What did everybody do that did it right? Number one, they pushed the spread down to 10 to 20 per million, or if you're per 100,000, which is what our state graph showed, it'd be one to two per 100,000. You have to push it down to that level in order to get things under control. It's like putting out a fire. You gotta get the raging fire put out before you go to the next stage. Then you gotta go in and make sure you keep that fire tamped down. To do that, you needed to put in place a testing strategy and contact tracing. We didn't do that, and we still don't have that in place to the degree that and to organization is necessary. We also needed a communication plan around suppression. So like Japan, which ha almost everybody in Japan wears masks. My daughter lives there. They're all wearing masks. And they did their, their avoid the seas uh, communication plan where they communicate this everywhere. Avoid closed spaces, crowded places, close contact, and masks. That alone almost controlled most of the Japanese epidemic. The other thing is they put in the contact tracing that we still don't have in place because we just don't have the testing. And you cautiously reopen only when the above is put in place. So we didn't put that stuff in place when we reopened. And then you respond immediately when cases rise, which we also didn't do. Um, so here's an example, and this is uh, United States versus Italy. So United States, you know, we went up, we went down a little bit, and then we went way, way up. And this is Italy. So Italy had a horrible time in northern Italy. It was really ugly then. But they got it all the way down. They pushed it down into this 10 to 20 per million, and they are now below 5 per million, which is what I would consider a green threshold, and that's what Ali Khan's using. And that's what our state maps and county-level maps that we have on our public tableau show said. Green is this area that Italy and Germany and these countries got to, and this is where we need to go. You close in the yellow, you cautiously reopen the yellow, and then but you keep keep at it until you get to green. And this is what we didn't do in, in Lincoln. Uh, so I'll show you that. So again, you know, the 10 to 20 per million, which on 100 per 100,000 is one to two per 100,000. All these countries got there, they kept at it, and they got down to these very low levels, and none of us did it. So that's the problem. Um, so again, you got to put, you have all these pieces in place. One of them alone is not enough. It's a combined plan. It's like a car. You need, you need tires, you need a transmission, you need an engine, you need brakes, you need all four of them to have a safe car. You can't just have a good engine. And so this problem with our plan is we just didn't put in a complete plan. Uh, the former CDC chief, one of those things was re re uh, turnaround time on testing. This is probably one of our biggest failures, and it's getting worse in Lincoln, not better. Our turnaround time is about a week at best, uh, and this is one of the key performance indicator that, that Tom Frieden has said not a single state is reporting, which much to him, uh, the rest of our frustration.
Uh, and even the other indicator that's out there that also isn't being is how good is your contact tracing. And so Ali Khan tweeted this uh, a few days back. These are the things you need to have in place, and I'm yet to see any of this being reported in Nebraska or at, the, at our health department level. We have contact tracers, but the measure of the, are they doing their job is that. And so if you wanted a key performance indicator for a dashboard, you would want cases per 100,000 thresholds with a seven-day moving average for your county. Uh, you would want testing, number percent positive, and a turnaround time, and you want reports on contact tracing. Uh, and there's measures of how this is another list of those key performance indicators put out by Tom and Frieden, the former CDC director. A lot of these are out there, so why is nobody looking at this? So what might this look like for Lancaster County? One is we need a dashboard that actually has some good thresholds on it to say, okay, to the community, how are we doing? If we want to do what all these other countries did that did it right, they pushed it down to yellow, and we never got to yellow when we started opening up. Uh, and then once we opened up, we didn't put any of the other things in place. We didn't get the contact tracing to the degree we needed. Uh, we didn't do the communication strategy. We didn't require masks. And lo and behold, it went right back up again, uh, and as any epidemiologist would have predicted. And then to make matters worse, it took us three weeks to do anything about it. We sat there and watched for three weeks as those numbers went up. That should have told us that our plan was not working and we should have changed. Why did it take three weeks to change that plan? So you should look at this. This is your ultimate measure. You should look at, we do have case counts per week and percent positive, but we still don't have turnaround time. It should be in the one to two days range, not in the seven day range. And then we should have a, a measure of contact tracing. How many of these people have actually been contact? How many have been isolated? Uh, how many have under isolation? This is a measure of what things are doing. Any role run business would have this. And you as taxpayers are paying a lot of taxpayers. It's justified. You should expect this and we are not seeing it. Um, and the, my, my biggest fear right now is if we don't get it right this time, our hospitals will be overwhelmed this fall when flu season starts. Uh, flu season on a, on a bad flu season year, that's enough to fill hospitals. If we have that plus coronavirus, it's going to be a nightmare come October, November, December. And this one's going to make New York look like a walk in the park if we don't get it right this time. Um, so that enough bad news. There is good news on the horizon. So actually there are more, multiple vaccine candidates, including a trial in Nebraska starting next week. And there are actually three Nebraska communities that are part of this trial, Grand Island, Norfolk, and Omaha, uh, under Meridian Clinical Research. So there are multiple vaccine candidates that are, look really promising. Uh, now it's still going to take a while. This is going to take uh, probably th at least six months just to find out if it works and start ramping up capacity. So, you know, it, it, it's probably January before you get a vaccine at least, but you know, hey, there, it's promising. And so this is the fastest a vaccine has ever been put into place before. So if this is successful, this will be great. Uh, and it's just not, not just us, this from Lancet, there's an English trial also that it looks promising. They're having good antibody responses. So this is very, very good news actually. So if we can put a plan in place and, and tamp it down for the next six months, we could save hundreds of thousands of American lives instead of rushing to herd humanity in the disastrous fashion we're, we're rushing to right now. Uh, mortality data, uh, so this is getting complicated. The good news is that most young people are not going to die, and being a father of three daughters, that's the most important thing to me is that my daughters will be okay. Uh, but, you know, people my age, unfortunately, we're dying, so this is concerning. Uh, we're getting clear numbers on mortality data. The initial thought was that somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5%. Uh, this new meta-analysis shows that it's a little lower than that. It's They're, they're saying the average is 0.68. Still a lot of Americans. So if we were rushed to herd immunity with, uh, with uh, not a lot of control, that could still be 2 million dead Americans. But we hopefully will not do that. The other thing is this number will drop over time. So it may have been 1% uh, six months ago, back before we had the treatments we have. So if right, so case reports a few months ago showed more ICU mortality rates in the 70% range. Well, if we're pushing those down to 40%, that cuts mortality from the 1% to the 0.5%. So if by waiting we are saving lives, so it's not like this is inevitable and we're just got to go through it no matter what, we can delay it enough to the point where our mortality will drop dramatically just because doctors and the ICUs and the nurses and the respiratory therapists are just getting better at their job. We get more treatments. There is a, such a huge reason to slow this down. Uh, another good thing on the horizon is the uh, convalescent plasma I talked about a while back. Uh, Johns Hopkins on Monday did a, a re, they brought Dr. Uh, Casadevel back. And actually, the good news is the studies are in progress. They have 35,000 people in these trials. Uh, so far, it's showing that it's safe. So the you know for, for most important thing in medicine is first, don't kill anybody. Uh, so that's the, the studies appear to be safe, that it's work, that, and that, that number are promising. So we have 35,000 people in randomized controlled trials. This could come out pretty rapidly in the next month or two and give us yet another tool in our toolbox. Uh, the good news 
news is also is that the convalescent th serum is best when used early and so the one thing that made uh, coronavirus spread so fast is long latency period between infection to sick to hospital well that also gives you plenty of time to intervene in using something like convalescent plasma the other thing is that if this works it also makes it more likely the vaccine work and monoclonal antibodies to work so that's all good news potentially again if we can slow this down enough for this stuff to come online uh, the other interesting thing is mass, that mass not only might protect you from getting coronavirus in the first place, but even when it doesn't, it might make you much less sick. And the, 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 so there's a theory about viral load, that then the amount of virus you get hit with will determine how sick you get. And so by wearing masks, even if it doesn't work completely, it is actually going to make you less sick when you do get sick. And so this is a good podcast from uh, ZDog. It's really worth, uh, well, worth your time to watch. So last thing I want to talk, finish with is LPS graduation. So we are going to, looks like we're going to continue with LPS graduation in a very, very distance fashion. Uh, but I've got a couple things. As a school board member, I'll be giving a speech. And so I'm going to talk about a couple things. First is uh, this Dave Barry quote about a person who's nice to you but rude to the waiter is not a nice person. Uh, that's such a marker of true character is how people treat people they perceive as beneath them. And a lot of people perceive the waiters being beneath them. And if they perceive that alone, that means they're probably not a nice person. That's why I think it's good for everybody to work in food service at some point in your life. You learn a lot of people like that by waiting tables or flipping burgers. The other thing I want to, uh, the other quote I'm going to use is my one of my role models in life is Hans Rosling. He got famous for his book uh, Factfulness and his TED Talks about population health. Uh, he was one of the first people who had TED Talks go viral and have millions of views. But before he was a professor of population health in Sweden, he was actually an African missionary doctor. And I love this quote about him and compassion. And he said the most important aspect was politeness in treating people in Africa. Compassion was more important than the medical performance. In Africa, you did the best you could, but you could never compromise on how you treated people. And it's such a lesson we need to learn right now. There's so much spite and anger. We need more compassion. Uh, the other thing is uh, there was a speech by John Goodwin at the Malone Center uh, during the Black Lives Matters, and I liked his concept of move time. Of, it's time to move from raising a fist to doing the work. It's easy to complain and raise a fist in protest. It's really hard, though, to do work of actually change, and I was really impressed with him and how he talked about that. also reminds me of another community where we have Nick Kusick, uh, who's a well-known entrepreneur, former president of a chamber of commerce, and he told me one time, we got plenty of problem identifiers. What we need is more problem solvers. So my call to the young people at, at graduating from North Star is we need problem solvers. We need people willing to do the work. Yes, you want to raise your fist when something's wrong, but you got to move to actually doing the work. That takes time, persistence, organization. That's the hard part, and that's what we really need to move to. And we've got so much to rebuild in the United States. We have so much potential. Uh, so as you know, Lincoln Public Schools re released its uh, measures this week. Uh, this actually is really the, the crux of it. As individuals, we need to do all this. When we're sick, we need to stay home. We need to wear face coverings. We need to wash our hands. And we need to keep our distance. And this is what we're going to do for graduation. So uh, we're going to use the Pinnacle Bank Arena, and those kids are going to be sitting on the floor. They're going to be three to six feet apart. So there's the distancing side of it. They're all going to be aware of masks. Everyone is going to have to wear a mask. Uh, we're not going to shake hands because of the hand hygiene issue. And hopefully if we do all this, we can do things like a graduation safely, but we have to put all these things in place. Just like when we bring kids back to school. I hope we're going to have kids back to school, but that requires you and the community doing your next thing, the right thing in the next three weeks. We have to get rates lower than they are right now if we want to safely up in school. And there's only so much we at LPS can do about that. That's up to you. So lastly, this is uh, what I do for a living. This is not necessarily the opinion of all these people. Uh, but this is where I work, so you can verify that I'm not some uh, crazy YouTube person. I actually do have a job. I do have this background, uh, and hopefully this is all helpful to you.